Welcome to Whitewater, a place you can belong before you believe. Wherever you are on your spiritual journey, we want to help you take your next steps towards Jesus. We're both a gathered and scattered church, meeting on Sundays at Cascade Christian and in homes, parks, backyards, and online. We exist to be a blessing and bring the whole person and the whole community into a flourishing life with Jesus. Welcome to Whitewater. You know this one. Even when I'm at my worst, I am still of righteous birth. I'm covered by saving grace. Past, present, future, daddy raised. My heart is changing day by day. And when I run like wildfire, Still a ransom child Bob with blood spilled on a tree Sin, death, they have no hold on me My will is changing day by day And I'm not who I was And I am who I am, sin Stumbling saints He's not ever alone He's alive in my bones The ghost of God Sanctifies To flesh, love, joy, peace taking over the mess. It's all I'm wanting day by day. Still, I'm not, still, I'm not who I was. Now I am who I am, a sinner saved, a stumbling saint. of God sanctified
Whitewater, I'm Kate. Whether you are watching us online or on campus, know that Whitewater is a Jesus-centered church where you can belong before you believe. So if you are watching online right now, hit the subscribe button or follow us on Instagram to stay up to date. If you are new and want to know more about Whitewater, send an email to info at whitewaterchurch.org or visit us at our connect table after church. If you're looking to connect, join us for an event called Starting Point, February 13th at 1130. Come get to know our team and ways you can get involved at Whitewater. We look forward to seeing you there. Your generosity makes more of an impact than you know, from supporting our weekly ministries, keeping our lights on, and helping people find community online. If you are looking to give back and help further God's kingdom, there are two ways to give. You can go online or mail us a check. Thank you so much for your support. Generosity is love in action. Let me pray for us as we open our hearts for what Jesus has to say to us today. Father God, we thank you for today. We thank you for this opportunity to learn and to grow and to connect. Jesus, we just pray that you would continue to soften our hearts towards you um, and that you would continue to grow us um, into the people that you desire us to be. We love you, Jesus, and in your name we pray. Amen. this in Philippians chapter 2, verse 15, to the scattered church of ancient Philippi, shine like stars in the world. How do we shine like stars? In a dark world, how do we get brighter and not bitter? This is what we've been looking at the last few weeks together. So when I think of that question, how do we get brighter, not bitter, and from the perspective of chapter 2, um, from this, this letter from Paul, I think a good question is, who do we spend time with? Who are models and mentors that you look up to in your life? Do they demonstrate spiritual qualities um, that shine or maybe qualities that don't shine as much? You know, the people we spend time with have an enormous impact on our life. You show me the people in your life and I'll show you a strong indication of direct, the direction and quality of your life. The power of examples. <laughs> My wife, I remember a few few months ago, my wife goes, you are a bad example. As she began pulling wrappers out of every place I had sat in the house and in the car. She got from the living room, my office, car seat, actually two car seats. And she's like, all of this is from you. And the kids are leaving their wrappers everywhere. You're their example and you are a mess. You're disgusting. Don't worry, we patched it up and it, <laughs> it got better. But it was such a good reminder for me as a dad, like, oh yeah, my kids are watching. I'm an example for them. You know, Paul knew how much both good and bad examples impact our lives. In Philippians 4, 8 through 9, Paul writes this, Brothers and sisters, if anything is excellent, if anything is admirable, focus your thoughts on these things, all that is true, all that is holy, all that is just all that is pure and all that's lovely, all the things worthy of praise. Practice these things. Now underline that, practice these things. Whatever you've learned, received, heard, or saw in us, the God of peace will be with you. Practice these things. Paul is getting at that uh, principle of example or imitation. Um, he, he knows that we are uh, imitators. That's how we learn. The academic term for that is mimetic, like learning by imitation, by watching. So practice these things, he says. My son practices and imitates everything he sees. My son copies everything he sees. When he, what he sees me do, he practices, he does, he imitates. Uh, one time I was walking to the house and I was talking to Sarah and I was, you know, kind of talking passionately about ministry and things that were going on. And I was kind of using my arms, my hands, and I was putting my, my hands on my hips. And as I was talking to her, my wife just busted out laughing. I'm like, why are you laughing at me? I'm like, I'm serious. This isn't something to laugh at. She's like, look at your son. 
And I looked over and he had his hands on his hips and he was like frowning like this. And then he was looking at me and I was like, what are you doing, Wes? And he's like, what are you doing, Wes? And I was like, I know what you're doing. He goes, I know what you're doing. Uh, And uh, so it went, he copies everything. You know, Wes went through a phase where he was always using the term gurrific from Daniel Tiger. Um, He loves to dance to Back in Black by ACDC and he's got a certain dance and uh, I'm like, man, I think uh, I think you definitely got that from from Angus. We are creatures of imitation, and Paul knows how much we imitate and learn from the models and the mentors around us. He knows how important imitation is to our learning and to our being. Paul is like a father who knows he's not always going to be there, you know, for this church and this spiritual family. In fact, he's in chains in prison in this moment that he's writing this letter, and he wants his spiritual children to know how to discern healthy models and unhealthy models, good mentors and maybe mentors that aren't as healthy. He's training his sons and daughters to have eyes for models of discipleship, to help them mature and grow more like Jesus, the servant king. We're going to go through chapter two, and we're going to look at what I think are some key passages um, where we can learn indirectly from Paul talking about um, these relationships he had that really talk about modeling and mentoring people in the gospel, in the kingdom, in the way of Jesus. And I think when we read this, we're going to learn how Paul taught people to learn how to learn, um, how to, you know, not just know, know what to think, but learn how to think and how to act and, you know, really how to be human. And uh, this aspect of spiritual growth this idea of imitation of, of leaders in our lives and people we respect, um, this, this aspect of spiritual growth has a huge impact. And this subject of modeling and mentoring um, in a kingdom way, in a Christ-like way, th- this is a huge aspect of spiritual growth. And it has a huge impact on whether we get brighter or bitter, whether we shine like stars in the darkness or we become more like the darkness. So consider what Paul wrote more indirectly about Christ-like models and mentors, um, specifically about his friends Timothy and Epaphroditus. Isn't that a great name? Sounds like a, like a disease or something. But I'd say, man, that, that name might make a comeback. Um, if you're having some kids, think about it. Paul writes this in chapter 2, verse 19. I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to see you soon, so that I may be encouraged by hearing about you. You know, Timothy was a... Um, a leader, a young leader that Paul had mentored and uh, was an incredible leader in the church. And you actually hear his name throughout the New, New Testament. Listen to how Paul talks about him. You know, Timothy uh, is a Christ-like model that, he, that Paul wants to send to the Philippian church. Um, and let's read kind of the following text to find out why Timothy is identified as so Christ-like and such a good model. Because I think we can learn something about how to identify Christ-like models if we pay attention. So in verse 20, it says, I have no one like him. So he's saying he's a good example. But why is that? He goes on to say, he's a person who genuinely cares about your well-being. Isn't that cool? Like, he's a person who genuinely cares about your well-being. You know, I think we can always sense whether someone has our best interest in mind. And whenever I'm around people that I, f- I really get the feel that they, they care about me, and they really deeply care about my my well being. Just puts me at ease, and there's a there's bonds that form much quicker, and and trust is so much easier, and trust is so much better in a relationship like that. In verse twenty one, he says, "All the others put their own business ahead of Jesus Christ's business." So who are all the others? He's, you know, maybe talking about some leaders in Ephesus and other uh, places. He's he's talking about leaders who don't have the same character as Timothy. So these other leaders put their own business ahead of Christ's business. You know, Timothy is a great model of what his mentor Paul taught earlier in Philippians 2, um, verses 3 and 4, when he says, with humility, think of others as better than yourselves. And listen here, instead of each person watching out for their own good or their own interests or their own business, watch out for what is better for others. Um, this is almost a direct quote. Um, the NIV translates it uh, that Timothy didn't look out for his own interests. He looked out for the interest of Christ and for really for others. I mean, that's a strong connection. What he's saying, what Paul is saying, and don't miss this, is that 
um, Timothy doesn't just talk about Jesus, doesn't just talk about ministry, doesn't just seem like a good guy or appear like a good guy. He has Jesus Christ-like character. He He's humble and he lifts others above himself. When you're looking for models to follow, that's what we want to look for. So if we learn from Paul to train our eyes to see Christ-like models, you know, not non-Christ-like models, but ones who are like Jesus, um, these are going to be people who take the pattern of Jesus. Um, if you want to know what that looks like in brief and in short form, read the early chapter two, where he talks about Jesus, you know, this mindset that Jesus has that he, he emptied himself, he humbled himself and lifted others up. And he didn't take advantage of his own privilege of being in heaven, being the son of God to get what he wanted, but that he put others first. Christ-like leaders don't just talk about serving others, they actually serve others. So train your eyes for that. Look for the fruit of Christ in others. And notice that Paul doesn't lift up Timothy's excellent preaching, his charisma, how gifted he is, how popular or influential he is, how many friends he's got, you know, how many likes he gets on, you know, his social media, none of that stuff. He doesn't talk about any of it. What he talks about is is character. He talks about the kind of person Timothy is. From the way Paul's writing and the other writings we've read from Paul, Timothy may have lacked some confidence as a leader and maybe even appeal to, to people as a leader. Because in culture, sometimes, like in our culture, we're trained to look for certain leaders, the big charismatic ones, the ones with all the gifts, the ones with, you know, that everybody says that's a great leader, but they don't, you know, sometimes they don't know what's, what's in the engine. They're just looking at the, uh, the paint job. So remember, God doesn't look at our appearance. He looks at our heart. He looks at our character. Here's a question for you. Who are your examples and models of Jesus? Models of the gospel, models of, of servanthood. To identify that, ask like, do their lives point to themselves? Does their social media, does their language, does their um, planning and the things they pull you into, is it, is it to build them up and to build things that they want to do or that they care about? Or does it build others up? Is it self-centered or is it other-centered? Um, do they put their own business ahead of Christ Jesus' business? I want to really encourage you to start looking through the lens of Jesus when you're looking for people you want to model your life after, especially when we're going through hard times. If we want to learn how to get brighter, look for people who have gone through hard times or are going through it, and they're standing up under the pressure, and their, their light is shining even brighter. That, that is so valuable. Verse 22, you know his character, talking about Timothy, you know his character, how he labors with me for the gospel, like a son works with his father. Isn't that cool? Like Paul's putting a little bit of like, this is my boy. I love this. I love this guy. You guys better treat him good. And he's more than you think he is. And he means, he means so much to me. And this is that father-son language. It's, um, in this day and age, father-son language was also work language. So it not only meant like this degree of love and care and worth, but it also was talking about like a, like a son-father relationship, like an apprenticeship, learning the trade of the family. Most often the family father would be training the son in the family trade. Uh, Jesus' father was likely a carpenter, and that's where he probably learned his trade or masonry. Um, and uh, that was very, very normal. And so Paul in this moment is saying, hey, I have been passing on the trade of the kingdom, the gospel, and I've been partnered with Timothy. And I'm telling you, he is a son in every sense. I love him. He's an he's a incredible character, and he is skilled. I have taught him skills that you might not even see on the surface, but just let him go to work in your community, and you guys are going to be better for it. Pay attention to him. And I love this moment because then we're also seeing not only this model being kind of lifted up, but we're seeing a little glimpse into how uh, Paul mentors and how important mentorship is to Paul. So if we looked at like Christ-like mentorship um, or discipleship, might be another word for it, it's learning discernment um, on how to see who could be a mentor for us and who could help us. I, I grew up in a, in a setting for early part of my life where I kind of learned that or, or thought that like, 
mentorship and discipleship was like one on one. Like it was just you had your one mentor and you were learning to like your rabbi and you were to learn from that one person. But the, but the more leaders I encountered, the more I read the Bible and um, just God's work in my life, I came to realize like you know no one's going to be exactly Jesus. And when you look at the Bible's given to us so we can learn from all these different models within the scriptures, and we are given so many people in our lives that have different gifts, different perspectives. We can have so many different mentors and models in our own life. I just think that's healthy because you can learn different things from, from different people. But sometimes there's these moments like these mentorships that can, that can form that are really special. And there's like a, there's like a chemistry there. One of the only ways that we can actually learn how to get good mentors. I mean, you you learn from what we can in scripture. We learn from guys like Paul. You you learn from Jesus. But in real time, you had you have to make decisions that like I can't make for you. Your mom can't make for you. Others can't make for you. Or maybe some moms or or friends have tried to make for you. But at some point you've got to make your own decisions and you've got to discern wisely who to let into that those growth areas of your life. One of the most important ways to do this is um we learn from other people without judging them wrongly. Say, oh, that's not a good leader. Because Timothy might not be someone you would want to follow. Again, you might not have the followers. You might not have the influence, the look, the talent, whatever. But if we're wanting to learn to look beyond that to the heart and not judge them wrongly, we need to take a posture of, of humility, the posture of a, of a servant, consider others as better than us and learn from them. And the more we have that posture, the more your eyes are going to be open for people who have real wisdom, not fake wisdom, not cheap wisdom, not like you should go do this, but I've never done it before, you know, uh, do as I say, not do, not as I do type of wisdom, but real, genuine, godly wisdom. You're going to be able to see it better. And I want you to, to see this picture. Timothy had Paul as a mentor, right? Well, think about Paul's story. Paul had Barnabas. He actually had other leaders, too, within the church who eventually started investing in him when they saw it was safe to be around him after he found Christ and wasn't, like, persecuting Christians anymore. You know, that that definitely needed some, you know, some mentoring there. <laughs> who are mentors that you have allowed into your life to speak into maybe some of the broken areas, areas of pain, and areas of skill that you need to build? I see a lot of young leaders that are afraid to let people a little bit farther ahead, maybe people who are more gifted, pe- people who uh, might be better at something than they are because they don't want to, they don't want to show that they're not, you know, as good or they don't want to show that they don't have that skill. But man, you're never going to learn if you don't open up. So when I think of some of my mentors, I think of, uh, I'll give you a few names. You won't know these people, but they mean something to me. And uh, I've learned so much from each one of these, but my grandpa, my grandpa, George, I, I, I learned from him that a heart of thankfulness changes everything. A heart of thankfulness leads to a heart of prayer. That guy was a prayer warrior. Uh, my friend, Darren uh, Shesky, I learned that guy is probably the most amazing steward of influence. He's just so good at like stewarding influence with people and with others. And he's just, he's amazing at it. And he's got an incredible leadership mind. Friend, Lowell Bakke, learned from him. Um you know, he's such an encourager. He's just finds ways to lift others up. He's uh, like the biblical character Barnabas. And he's one of the guys that taught me, train your eyes for grace, look for grace. So there's just so many people. I could list off so many um, within our staff, with this church that, I've, uh, that have mentored me. Who are your mentors? Who have you let into those, the cracks and maybe the shards of your life? to help you um, become who God wants you to be. Maybe God has actually sent them and you just need to engage them. So one question that comes up whenever we talk about mentorship is like, well, how do I get someone to mentor me? Like, how do I go about that? Because people are like, it feels awkward. Be like, hey, would you mentor me? Or uh, how do I do that? So uh, just a few tips real quick in the middle of this sermon. Um, And I'm not saying that this is scripture or anything, but this is some stuff I've learned is one, just ask somebody. If you see somebody you respect and you really uh, you're feeling nudged by the Holy Spirit and you're like I I could learn from them and I man ask them and make sure you respect their time. If someone if it's someone you admire, it's very likely that they're busy people that they're doing a lot of good things um, and and so respect their time. Show them that you care you care about them and respect their time. Um, be clear with them about what aspects of their life draw you toward them, like the things that 
you want to learn from them. Like, wow, I wish I could do more of that. Or I wish I knew how to do that. I wish I knew how to pray like that. I wish I could have a marriage like that. I wish I could, you know, like, uh, I could de-escalate situations like that person, you know, let them know what you admire about them, what you'd like to learn. And, and here's another, this is key. Don't come back asking for more lessons or more time from them unless you've practiced what they taught you. So make sure that you do what they taught you from the, the last meeting. And once you've done and learned from uh, that lesson, come back to them and tell them what you learned and then say, I'm ready for more. And I'll, I'll, I'll tell you, if, if you have someone who's real busy, they're like, even if they're like, you know what, I don't think I have time right now. If you, if you keep um, at it, just asking once in a while, ping in, or just let them know, hey, I learned this about you and I, I practiced this and this is how it changed my life. I'm telling you, it's, uh, it, it has a way of wearing on the heart when you see somebody who's wanting to learn. They really want to be a learner and they know that you're not going to waste their time. You're going to value it. Some of you guys might be on the journey uh, with your faith where you're going through what some people call deconstruction. And this is kind of, um, I think it's something that has some good and corrective qualities to kind of help people sift out some of the bad or toxic or unhealthy aspects of religion. But I think Paul actually helps provide maybe some guidance, like he's a guide or a mentor for us who might be going through some of that deconstruction phase toward hopefully a reconstructive phase. Um, I, I think he provides great mentorship. Because I, I would say one of the things, if you're going through that journey, just make sure you don't get so absorbed in deconstructing theology and structures and you know things and people that you forget to appreciate the good mentors and models of faith God has put in your life. You think about Paul's story. I mean, he he was following religion. It was and he was doing some toxic, awful things, and and he had a major transformation. He had to reevaluate everything in his life and what his faith was and how he felt about it and what he did. He had some key mentors come into his life that God gave him that helped him on his journey. So sometimes we can just forget to remember those models and mentors that have demonstrated the best qualities of faith, not just the worst. If we forget the good and the good mentors and models and the lessons they've taught us, what are we going to be able to build? What are we actually learning? So that's just a word of encouragement for people on that journey. Paul continues in the same vein about mentorship and, and models of Christ-likeness. Verse 23, so he is the one that I hope to send as soon as I find out how things turn out here for me. I'm going to send you Timothy, he's saying, and you know, as soon as I find out what my prison sentence is going to be, like what are they going to do with me here? That's his reality. And here's this guy talking about sending mentors and loving this church. He's not like going, woe is me and complaining and grumbling. He's trying to bless others. I just love how other-centered Paul is, even when he's in chains. Verse 24, I trust in the Lord. Oh, that's good. I trust in the Lord that I also will visit you soon. He's just like, oh, I trust the Lord. It's, he's always been so good to me as he's sitting in chains. I think it is also necessary to send Epaphroditus to you. Now listen to this uh, model for the Philippian church. He is my brother, my coworker, fellow soldier, and he is your representative who serves my needs. Like you sent him to me to help serve me. Just know he's my coworker. He's a soldier with me. Like he is a model of faith. In verse 26, he says, Epaphroditus, he misses you all. And he was upset because you heard that he was sick, and in fact, he was so sick that he nearly died. But God had mercy on him, and not just on him, but also on me, because his death would have caused me great sorrow. So here, Paul's in prison. This is just a small point, but I think it's worth mentioning. Paul's in prison, and he's blessing other people, and he's writing about, like, how do we live this life like Christ and become brighter and shine like stars in the darkness. I mean, he might even be preaching to himself. And I love that Paul isn't um, this like hopeless optimist or he, he, like trying to be in denial of reality. Like he's in prison and this is hard. This is not what he wants. Paul has hopeful realism. He's not pretending things are better than they are. He's, he has real hope in Christ real hope in the kingdom, but he's in a hard situation. And in this mo I think there's this moment of honesty where he, and vulnerability where he just said, you know, if I would lose um, my friend that you sent me, I would have great sorrow. It'd be a tremendous loss. 
I, I think there's something to learn about hope in this, and this is what I would just say to, to anybody who's facing this kind of discouragement and how do we deal with it. You know, hope isn't everything good, everything's great, nothing's bad. You know, like someone's arm is falling off and they're like such a good Christian. They're like, everything's good, everything's great, nothing's bad. You know, their arm falls off. Um, <laughs> that's not what Paul is saying. So hope isn't everything's good, everything's great, nothing's bad. Hope is it's not good now but I believe it will get brighter and better later. I just think that's so important that we, we, we never let go of, of hope. We always hold on to it. We recognize, hey, it can be bad right now. It's not great right now, but it's going to get better. And maybe some of you are sitting right now in the middle of reality currently and just feeling like, is this ever going to end? It's not good now, but... Christians, we have the faith that it's going to get better, it's going to get brighter, and so will you. Verse 28, therefore, I'm sending him, Epaphroditus, immediately so that when you see him again, you can be glad and I won't worry. So welcome him in the Lord with great joy and show great respect for people like him. I love that. Show great respect for people like him. He risked his life and almost died for the work of Christ. That's servanthood. He did this to make up for the help you couldn't give me. Like He represented you. He did what others couldn't. There's something that's so important to show honor and respect to those who model Christ-likeness. Like when we're honoring them, that the, the, when they're being Jesus to you and me, or it's the, the world around them, we're, we're, we're honoring them and lifting them up. We're also honoring God saying, hey, we see, we see Jesus at work in you. And the world might be blind to it. People might not see it as important. People so easily overlook those little moments of loving people and kindness and patience and gentleness and all these Jesus things it can be, that the world can be so blind to. But us as Christians, we can encourage a brother or sister that are they're actually heroes in the faith. Like someday they're going to be in a hall of fame in heaven that nobody even knows about. They don't know the work that they've done. They don't know the good they've done. So let's honor and respect those people that God has put in our life as mentors and models. You know, Mr. Rogers had this thing he would do sometimes where uh, it would be with the dolls, it would be with anybody. He would, he would have them take a moment and say something like, hey, just take, let's take 60 seconds to think about the people who have impacted our lives, people who have helped us become who we are. So would you just maybe today with whoever you're sitting with watching this, whether you're alone or you're with some friends or family, would you just take 60 seconds to think about maybe the mentors and models of faith that God has given you? Just give it 60 seconds. They'll start coming. Those faces will start coming. And just think about them and let gratitude kind of fill your heart. Those names, those faces, let them know what they mean to you. I mean, do it today. I mean, you could do it this week, but come on, do it today. Text them, call them. If you have to do it later this week, that's fine. But let them know how they impacted you. Let us know how that goes. We want to encourage you and hear stories of, you know, how we're growing together in these times. Well, I hope maybe some of us who were not feeling very bright maybe struggling with some bitterness um, in these times, are learning with Paul and growing in our own hearts and we're feeling brighter. That's my hope. Guys, I love you so much. See you next week.
Multiply.